Hi, my name is Anna Roberts. Welcome to the Gospel Online. I'm going to be talking to you about the return of Jesus. When we talk about an event or someone's return, our first question is often when so-and-so is coming back. Oh, when is that? Such and such will happen. Oh, okay, when will that take place? But in the case of Jesus, we're not told when. There are no dates, no times. In fact, it's clear that that information is a secret. Even Jesus himself didn't know. And he told his followers that only the Father knows the day and the hour that he will come back. So let's put aside the question of, of when and start instead with why. Jesus Christ is coming back. Why? Comebacks are a phrase that we often associate with sports stars or, or celebrities, those who may have retired or disappeared from the spotlight and then decide for whatever reason to return, to reappear once more on the public stage in an attempt to prolong their fame and possibly their fortune too. They're making a comeback. But why is Jesus coming back? It's been 2000 years since his first advent. One might argue his fame, his name, his story is as well known now as it ever was. Except that his story isn't ended. Let's take a step back for a moment and look at the bigger picture. Uh, and spoiler alert, if you haven't read the Bible before, or you're unfamiliar with its plotline, I may be giving away some of the, the key moments. The Bible begins with a book about beginnings. Genesis is the starting point. It starts by introducing us to the, the location, the environment in which the story will take place. We see the, the earth revealed. And everything that is made is described as very good. There is order and structure. There is a, a harmony. We're presented with repeated pattern and rhythm. And the whole thing is, is set up. And into that location is placed humankind, the pinnacle of this creative work, a higher life form made in the creator's image. Humans are given the ability to reason the power of logic and speech, the wonder of emotion. And they're invited to enjoy their habitat while at the same time being given instruction and responsibility. But within a few pages, disaster strikes. Like so many stories, we're introduced to a villain, one who is cunning and deceitful. Lies are told, actions are taken, and actions have consequences. Suddenly, beautiful life is, is counterbalanced by inglorious death. There is a curse. There is pain, expulsion. With the result that we're also introduced to a hero, a saviour. Someone who can change this gloomy outlook. There is a prophecy, a foretelling of a struggle. Injury will take place, but there is the promise that good will, will triumph ultimately. And this is only in the first three chapters. Then time moves on. We have glimpses, whispers, shadows. There are many battles. We're introduced to leaders, to, to prophets and priests. There are many successes and failures. But all the while, there is this undertone of anticipation, of expectation. When will this hero emerge? What will he be like? It's not until three fifths of the way through that we finally meet him and he's not who you would expect 
His arrival is understated and low key. He doesn't behave in a way that you might expect heroes to. In fact, he dies. Willingly, he gives up his life. Like it was part of the plan. In awful circumstances, he is the victim of a terrible hate crime. But all is not lost. He re-emerges from the dead and establishes his credentials and his existence with his followers. Only to disappear a month and a half later with the promise that he will return. It's not until the last book that we are given perhaps the most powerful picture of all. The book of Revelation, that's enigmatic message full of, of sign and, and symbol and caricature closes with a, a picture of Jesus coming back. When you stop to think about it, that's entirely appropriate. A revelation is just that, isn't it? A revealing. And the very last words are an appeal. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Now that's very much a macro level, a 50,000 foot view, if you like. But we're still left with that question of why. Why is Jesus coming back? To finish what he started. To bring about the kingdom of God. Jesus taught his followers to pray, thy kingdom come. He's going to start a new era because the world needs peace. The poor need equality. Viruses and diseases need a cure. The oppressed need justice. The earth needs healing. The reality is, the sad reality, that there is zero chance of finding an answer to any of those issues without the intervention and help of Jesus. There's one pivotal moment when Jesus is on trial and accusations are flooding in about who he is and, and what he's done. And the Roman governor of that Palestinian region, Pontius Pilate, is, is struggling to, to make sense of it. He's, he's trying to navigate his way through this political minefield. And as he searches for truth and, and tries to separate fact from, from fiction, he, he asks Jesus, are you a king? And Jesus, in response to that, says, my kingdom is not of this world. Wow, what, what a powerful statement. My kingdom is not of this world. And it's, it's left hanging. He, he doesn't explain. He doesn't elaborate. It's what my kids would call a, a mic drop. But uh, we as, as readers are, are left in no doubt that there is this certainty. Something remains yet to happen. There is a kingdom to come. Which leads us, I guess, to our third question, how? We've briefly considered when. We've thought about why. So how? How will Jesus come back? How does a, a carpenter, a preacher from two millennia ago, reinsert himself into this postmodern digital world? To help to answer that, I want to tell you four stories. Story number one. It was early morning, around 8 a.m., I want to say April, 
and I had just got to work um, and I was walking from the car park uh, into the office and it was it was light but not sunny you know it was one of those sort of gray days and suddenly the sky began to darken and I don't just mean it, it went cloudy it, it really started to go dark and by the time I got into the office it was almost black outside to the point where people were, were going to the windows and, and using words like apocalyptic. As you looked out, it was literally like nighttime, even though it was now around 8.15 in the morning. And suddenly there was this incredible flash of light. Lightning split the sky, followed pretty soon by this enormous thunderclap. I can't remember if it rained or not, but there was the most amazing electrical storm. A and the sky was, was, was just ablaze with, with flashes and zigzags of lightning. Story number two. Not long after my wife and I were married, we lived in Cardiff. And we agreed and decided that it was time for me to buy a mountain bike. I'm not a, a massive cyclist, but I enjoy it. And I was quite excited. I'd had other bikes before, but this was the first time to own something that would be suitable off-road. Um, we lived at the time at the end of a, a cul-de-sac. Um, and we went, um, as one did, to the bike shop. Um, we'd done some research. I'd done some reading. Uh, and we talked to the um, to the guy there and eventually I chose what he recommended and, and what I thought was was a, a bike that um, that my budget could afford. Later that week we, we stored it in the garden shed. Later that week I got a phone call um, and it was unusual my wife didn't normally ring during the day but I could tell something was wrong and she said something awful's happened We've had a break in. Your bike has been stolen. And there was that moment, and your heart starts beating. And this, this horrible sense of realization that your, your space has been invaded. It, it was the shock. Thankfully, no one had been in any danger. But we lived in what we felt was a safe area, neighborhood. There had been no burglaries of late. And because I guess it was quiet and we lived at the end of the street, we had imagined that things were safe. It was so unexpected. Story number three. I can still picture where I was on the 11th of September 2001, standing in the office as a colleague burst in and announced that there had been a terrorist attack in the United States of America. And as we turned on the television and started to look at the news feed on the internet, horrors of that terrible incident started to flood in. And it soon became clear that this would change the shape of the world. I imagine that's how many people are feeling now about the current COVID-19 virus. Or perhaps for previous generations, how they felt after World War. And no doubt you can bring to mind other world-breaking, world-changing events that have a truly global impact. These things can define at least certain periods of our lives. Story number four. During the summer holidays, my wife took our two children to a theme park. They were particularly excited because they'd reached that minimum height requirement that is um, necessary for a number of the, the cool rides. They were desperate to try a roller coaster, 
the thrill of being turned upside down and uh, gyrated through 180 degrees in a corkscrew um, was something that they were keen to experience. And after the ride, off they got, and my wife was jabbering away about how amazing this, this experience had been. But my son, who was probably about eight at the time, was silent. He had what my wife said was almost a, a stunned look on his face. At least a minute went by and he still hadn't spoken anything to the point where she started to wonder if, if we'd done some psychological damage. And after about two minutes, finally, his face cracked into the largest smile. And he said, that was awesome. The happiness of the event has stayed with him for some time. The relevance of those four stories will become apparent in our second part. I don't know about you, but uh, sometimes I, I find it helpful to take a break, uh, stretch one's legs, uh, pause for thought. So please grab a drink or uh, whatever uh, and we'll resume our thoughts in a short while. Hi, welcome back to part two of The Return of Jesus. I work in data analytics, putting together statistics and information to support my company. One of the key things about business intelligence is the power of a fact-based argument, having the evidence to back up the case you're making. Um, there's a great quote from an American statistician, William Edwards Deming, in God we trust, all others must bring data. Perhaps it was tongue in cheek, but he has a point. So what is God's evidence for the return of Jesus? I thought it might be helpful if we took a look at the Bible's own internal data. There are over 300 references to the return of Jesus in the New Testament. Here's a chart illustrating that. Unsurprisingly, most of them, the majority, occur in the Gospels, over 170 references. As you can see, there's quite a dip then to the Acts of the Apostles, who were so invigorated and excited by the resurrection of Jesus that this became the focus of their message. However, references pick up in the letters that Paul wrote and also in the other letters from other writers. And then we climax in the last book, the book of Revelation, where again we have over 70 references to Jesus' return. 
thinking particularly then about Jesus's own commentary. He told over 70 stories about his return to the earth. Here's just a, a, a little indication of uh, the way in which Jesus talked about his coming. 35% direct references, 29% in parables, uh, and so two thirds then uh, in, in that, uh, those two quadrants. Uh, and then as you can see, a split out of other references, things like the day of judgment, the end of the age, and references to the last day. You might remember in part one, I told you four stories. The well-known um, CEO of Apple commented that the most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. So what was the significance of those four stories? Well, I talked to you about um, an incredible storm that I'd witnessed. And Jesus commented that his own coming would be as cataclysmic as that, as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. In story number two, I mentioned to you that I'd had my new mountain bike stolen. It never did get fined, and if the Cardiff police are watching, I'd be grateful for its return. Jesus said, know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming he would not have left his house to be broken into you also must be ready for the son of man is coming at an hour you do not expect jesus return will not only be amazing it will also be unexpected behold said john he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him even those who pierced him and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Story number three was about worldwide events that impact the globe. And the coming of Jesus will be one such thing as that. And finally, I talked to you about my son's encounter on a roller coaster uh, and how he was uh, exhilarated by that experience. Peter comments that um, although believers were not able to see Jesus at the point at which he was writing, one day they would. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible. The outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This will happen, says Peter, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. But that's only half the story. What, what about the other 60% of, of this book? What about the Old Testament? Well, even there, the work of Messiah and the need for the second coming of Jesus is presented. We could fill lots of, of videos if we tried to. But I've picked just three references to go through with you. Uh, and they're they're each from one of the sections of the Jewish scriptures. So we've taken an example from the law, the Torah, uh, another passage or uh, example from one of the prophets. Uh, and finally, we're going to look at a poem from that section of the scriptures called the writings. So let's think about the festival of Yom Kippur. God's people had a calendar of feasts, holy days, that marked out their year. The seventh month was one of the busiest periods. And on the tenth day of the seventh month was a special day called Yom Kippur, the day of covering or the day of atonement. It was a time when the people could be um, reconciled, cleansed, they could be made one or at peace with their God. It was a day of rest, a day when no one worked, except for one guy who had perhaps one of the most hectic days of his whole year. The high priest was on duty. It was his responsibility to carry out this atonement, this reconciliation. The day involved a, a series of offerings of rituals 
climaxing in the the sacrifice of one animal, a, a goat, and the letting go of another, the Azazel, the scapegoat. The whole day was was full of significance, but it ended with the emergence from the most holy place, the the inner sanctum that that represented the very presence of God. The high priest came out for a second time, and when he did, he blessed the people. It was that second coming of the high priest that the whole nation waited for. It marked the completion of the feast. They knew that their their mistakes, their, their errors, the issues of the past year had been done away, and now they could make a fresh start. The writer to the Hebrews in the New Testament tells us or helps us to understand the significance of this feast. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. The first advent of Jesus, his, his death, dealt with sin and and a lot of of what is wrapped up in this day of atonement is aligned with that but says the writer his second coming his coming back his return will be when we know the process is complete that's when the the process of salvation will be finished The second event I've chosen to share with you is one uh, of the less well-known prophets from the book of Habakkuk, um, a prophet who gave his very name to the book. It's a fascinating story uh, about a man who was wrestling with the world around him. He was troubled by the violence in society, by the increased crime, by prevailing injustice, and by a corrupt political system. And he questions to God how a moral being can allow this to continue. God responds and assures him that it won't. In fact, he shares an insight with Habakkuk that the Chaldeans, um, the rising superpower of that day, were already planning an attack. This news, while answering the the prophet's um, initial concern presents him with a, a, a second and different challenge. What if, what if the cure is worse than the sickness? The, the solution from God seems so severe, so brutal, that these people could wipe out everything and, and everyone. In answer to Habakkuk's second question, God shares a vision and tells him to record it for future audience. To accompany the the, the picture, the the message, God um, provides a a catchphrase, a, a rallying cry for believers. The righteous will live by their faith or the just will live by their faith. It became uh, like a watchword for those to take comfort that they would not necessarily be destroyed. Again, it's the New Testament, though, that helps us interpret this ancient vision. You see, the ultimate answer to um, the world's problems, which are very similar to those that Habakkuk was wrestling with, lie in the form of a person in the return of Jesus. And that catchphrase that God put out there is still relevant. Those who want to be right, those who want to do right, must believe in what God is doing. For you need endurance, says the writer, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet in a very little while, the one who is coming will come and will not delay. Uh, And that Last sentence is a quote from Habakkuk.
Our third and final example that we want to look at is a poem. Sometimes we forget that in this superlative volume uh, of divine composition, there are many forms and, and literary techniques. Uh, and one of those is, is poetry. And I'm going to read you Psalm 2. It's a psalm that illustrates the fact that Jesus is coming back. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Time doesn't as allow for us to unpick the details of those powerful lines. But what the poem presents is a, a picture of what God's aim and objective is in relation to his son. One day, Jesus will reign over the world, over all nations. All countries will be subject. The advice of the, of the psalm, the advice from above, is that they should submit willingly. Uh, 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 and not uh, uh, and avoid confrontation it will not end well if they don't so there we have it three examples but there are many more ample proof that the bible clearly and unambiguously foretells the return of jesus but what does that mean for us I want to share a short video with you made by a friend of mine who describes in it his, his hope. It is times like these that the need for change becomes ever more apparent. In this unprecedented condition, now more than ever before, people need to be able to trust in those steering the ship. But again, despite their best efforts, Downing Street has become a glass house and the closer you get, the dirtier the windows become. Now, I didn't vote Conservative before this crisis, nor will I after. And no, I didn't vote Labour or Lib Dem. Not the SNP, the BNP, the DUP or any other P. I just can't trust in these parties. Instead, I cast my vote in the one place I can trust in the Most High who rules in the kingdoms of men and his Son, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Yes, in this 21st century, I still have a faith. I need a faith because I don't believe that any party can solve these problems alone, no matter how hard they try. And as much as I respect, admire and honor every key worker, every honest politician striving to make the world a better place, I have a hope that one day they won't be needed. The prophet Isaiah says that Jesus will stand in Jerusalem, on earth, not up in heaven, and he will judge between nations, and he will decide the disputes for many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not learn war anymore. This was a prophecy about Jesus, not the United Nations. The Bible says that Jesus will return 
and will cleanse this world. Now I know that you might not believe any of this, but this is my hope, this is what the Bible says, and it's what I believe. I won't force it on you, and I won't treat you badly if you don't share my beliefs, but I want you to know that in this time of crisis, when I know that I can't find hope in the leaders of this age, I'm not scared. I am social distancing. I'm applauding every Thursday. I'm paying my taxes and I am praying that this time will pass. But I am waiting patiently, quietly, excitedly for the return of Jesus. We mentioned earlier in this talk that human beings have the power of logic and reason. If something is true, we have a choice whether to accept it and what to do about it. We have the opportunity to be part of something bigger, to accept the invitation that has been extended to all to be part of God's kingdom and the return of Jesus. Not only that, but we also have the spirit of hope. Where does that spirit come from? I, I guess it's innate in all of us, but it stems from knowing that this is not the end, that the king will return, that the battle can be won, that good is destined to triumph. It comes from believing the promise of a brighter future and a better tomorrow. Just as the Bible's story is unfinished, so your story is too. How it ends is up to you. Mm -hmm.